afternoon to everyone. My name is Irma Jimenez. I'm in charge of corporate affairs at HP. And on behalf of Hewlett Packard Enterprise, I would like to thank you, thank all the participants for joining this conference on information technologies and circular economy. Uh, we all know that the um, Green Deal and also the circular economy action plan of the European Commission recognizes the very important role of technology as a key enabler for a more sustainable society and a more sust sustainable economy. Uh, today, we would like to focus on how the conception of technology as a service entails significant benefits for the environment and hence can boost the circular economy. Uh, to do so, I would like to also warmly thank, thank our distinguished speakers for accepting to participate in this webinar. We have the honor to have with us Mrs. Florica fink Oher. She's the Director General of DG Environment of the European Commission. We have Mrs. Josephine Inch, Officer in Charge of Sustainable Economy and Procurement within ICLE which is a global network of local governments for sustainability in Europe. And we have David Peck, Associate Professor in the Delft for Climate Design and Sustainability at the Delft University for Technology. Last but not least, as speakers, we do have as well our two, uh, two colleagues, uh, our Global Chief Sustainability Officer, Brian Tippens, and also Gareth Bevan, Senior Technology Sustain for Sustainable Transformation. And now I would like to hand over to our moderator, Sonia Van Rensen, and she will guarantee a very dynamic and exciting debate. Thank you very much, Irma. It's uh, a pleasure to be here um, with all of you this afternoon. Uh, my name is Sonia van Rensen and I work for Energy Monitor, uh, a website that was set up uh, exactly one year ago today, actually, um, which is dedicated to the, the energy transition. And that means the, the transition to, to net zero and more specifically the role of energy therein. Uh, and as of last week, I'm no longer the managing editor, but the editor in chief of, of this. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's nice to be here uh, joining you on our, our first anniversary. Uh, I would add that the digital technology is something that we have also been covering, um, including an article on how, how digital tech can, can turbocharge the energy transition. Uh, and that's something that was actually uh, based on Digital Europe's annual conference earlier this year. So a very relevant subject. What we're here to focus on today is more specifically the, the role of ICT in uh, sustainable public procurement. And the reason for this is, uh, is the Sustainable Product Initiative that is coming up later this year, due to be uh, launched by the European Commission in December, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And this, um, as Irma already said, is, is all in the context of the European Green Deal, uh, which basically aims to, to, to instigate, to facilitate a green economic recovery uh, in, in the wake of, of the COVID-19 pandemic, the ultimate goal is climate neutrality by 2050 and a prerequisite for that so so kind of working hand in hand is the the circular economy um, there is a circular economy action plan in that context and at the heart of that is uh, a revision of the eco design directive which will basically be extended to to more products extended scope beyond energy which was its original focus and aim to set product standards that ensure products are as durable, uh, resilient, efficient, um, repairable, et cetera, as possible. There's also a plan to introduce um, the first ever mandatory green public procurement standards. There, there have been such standards, but they have been voluntary so far and therefore haven't been taken up to the extent they might have. So what do we have in store for you today? We've basically got um, just under an hour and a half. And the idea is we're going to hear from, from HPE, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, the kinds of initiatives um, they're undertaking in the realm of sustainability and how and why this is a, a core part of their business strategy. 
We're going to hear from uh, the Director General for Environment at, at the Commission, as you've already heard, um, Florica, about the plans for the Sustainable Product Initiative. We've got David Peck, um, a circular economy expert, to, to tell us how promising those plans sound, I hope. Um, and then finally, we've got the procurer's uh, perspective via ICLE, so representing local governments, because ultimately, um, you know, what, what's the point of product as a service? There, there needs to be if there's no demand for it. So we're going to hear a bit more about what the, the consumer, what the, what the buyer is looking for. And we'll, uh, we'll have some concrete examples from HPE uh, on exactly how they're implementing the, the circular economy concepts. There's an invitation to everyone joining us to send in your questions. We will probably try and get through our speakers first. Um, but if you have a pressing question or something comes to mind as you're listening, I would say by all means, um, send it across, put it in the chat and we'll see if we can fit it in as we go. And if not, we will have time at the end for questions. So please do, do send through your ideas. I think that's it in terms of introduction. I'd like to hand over then to our first keynote speaker, um, Brian Tippins, who's here from HPE, Vice President and Chief Sustainability Officer. More than 20 years experience in the IT industry, great experience of sustainability within that. Um, previously ran HPE's global real estate portfolio with a focus on energy and sustainability. And you've also done a lot of work with, with suppliers to HPE IC. So over to you for an introduction on, on everything, all this uh, going on in the company today. Thank you very much, Sonia, for that introduction. Thank you also to Irma and thank you to Forum Europe for providing us this opportunity to share a bit of our thoughts on, on the subject. I wanna begin with a bit of an introduction of HPE's ESG strategy and the business case for integrating this into our core business. So at HPE, we have a very clear purpose, which is around advancing the way people live and work. And the events of the past year have really reinforced that commitment. Living progress is our business strategy for creating sustainable and equitable IT solutions that meet technology demands of the future. So ESG topics, as you know, and ESG risks are top of mind for all of us and remain so during the pandemic. We've also seen that companies with strong ESG performance continue to outperform the market and are better able to meet the needs of customers and investors. A few data points about that. For example, according to IDC, in the next four years, 90% of the world's largest public companies, the Global 2000 and the Global 2000, will mandate lower energy use, reusable materials, and carbon neutrality targets for IT facilities as prerequisites for doing business. And at HPE, we're already seeing this in action. Customer inquiries on sustainability have doubled over the past three years for us. So to address these heightening customer demands, we've seen tech companies engage directly with customers on IT efficiency and circularity, standing up a practice to brief customers on how innovative technological solutions can drive their business and sustainable object objectives. And the proof is really in the numbers, as in the US alone, the green tech industry increased in size by 34% in 2020 with this number expected to increase fivefold by 2030. And we definitely expect to see something very similar in Europe. Similarly, in the investor community, we're seeing growing recognition of the financial materiality of ESG issues. And the percentage of passive ESG ownership in our company is increasing quarterly and at a higher rate than that of our peers. So this ongoing market shift towards ESG integration, as well as increased demand for corporate social responsibility truly validates HPE's long-standing commitment to tying environmental and social commitments to our core values, to our purpose, and to our business strategy. These issues are truly embedded into our business strategy, building on decades of proven leadership to accelerate technology's role in advancing the way we live and work. For companies like HPE committed to accelerating a low carbon economy, focusing solely on operational efficiencies really isn't enough. Rather, we recognize an opportunity for companies and leaders to be early movers in implementing more sustainable business models. Let me talk a little bit about our pivot, our pivot to everything as a service, and how that yields more environmentally sustainable business models. We see at HPE tremendous opportunity to help our customers transform and to digitize while advancing their own sustainable business agendas. Well before the pandemic, we recognize that the digital transformation is the critical backbone of a modern enterprise. Yet, given growing demand for IT hardware and service offerings, exacerbated by the current pandemic, managing the energy and resource use associated with IT infrastructure 
is critical to enabling enterprises to truly scale. In 2019, HPE made the bold choice to reshape the company and to transform the market by offering every single one of our solutions available as a service by 2022. And we're definitely on track to deliver this. As we transition to making our offerings available as a service, we're delivering sustainable digital transformations for a hybrid world. As a service delivery models are driving a more circular and low carbon economy by enabling sustainable digital transformations for our customers. Customers are increasingly asking for solutions that will help address their environmental footprint, including improved efficiency, measurement of carbon impacts, minimization of energy use and materials, and adoption of new consumption models. Through our as-a-service portfolio, which we call HPE GreenLake, we're dispelling the notion that sustainable IT must be located in the public cloud. Two-thirds of applications will remain on-premises and can't move to the public cloud due to latency, compliance, governance, and or cost reasons. And as our CEO, Antonio Neri, has said many times, the future is hybrid. HPE GreenLake helps customers address the key causes of inefficiencies while executing an efficient hybrid multi-cloud delivery model, delivering many of the sustainability benefits commonly associated with the public cloud, such as decreased energy use and dematerialization of infrastructure through an as-a-service consumption model. For instance, in the average customer data center, 25% of compute resources are powered on, but not really doing any useful work. And the remaining assets are operated at a fraction of their capacity. This means higher costs and unnecessary consumption of power, space, and cooling. As a service delivery models address that by ensuring customers only use what they need. However, a true circular economy is not just about increased efficiency, it's also about improving product longevity. Recycling, remanufacturing, waste reduction are imperative to establishing a more sustainable tech sector in the EU. And HPE state-of-the-art technology renewal centers have the unique capability of refurbishing retired IT equipment from any manufacturer, giving these end-of-use assets a second life and keeping them out of landfill. So let me wrap by connecting the dots a little bit as to how an as-a-service model can help accelerate the EU's commitment to a low carbon and circular economy. This, would, we believe, will be the new normal. Companies who are preparing for a post-transition economy will eventually need to adopt these models across everything that they do. Across industry, there's really an opportunity to make a profound change to how products are designed, manufactured, supplied, and consumed. And the product as a service model is our solution. Moving towards a circular economy in which economic growth is decoupled from intensive resource use and waste generation will, according to the European, Commission, European Commission's Circular Economy Action Plan, make a marked contribution towards achieving climate neutrality by the year 2050. The Sustainable Product Initiative is really a crucial step in not only improving durability and reparability, but also ensuring that both industry and consumers really do more with less. As a service business models provide the perfect solution to ensure that this indeed is the case. And as a service model not only makes our economy more circular by breaking established patterns of mismatched supply and demand, it also has the potential to generate significant growth opportunities for any industry and for industry really as a whole. Thereby, it perfectly aligns with the Commission's Green Deal goals of ensuring that increased sustainability does not stifle growth and new business opportunities. So to that end, we'll continue to work with customers, with policymakers, with industry partners, with academia, with others to continue to find innovative solutions that lead companies through and beyond the low carbon transition. So we thank you very much for joining us today to engage in this really truly critical discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brian, uh, for a really interesting opening. I suppose a, a few figures that stay with me. You mentioned the, the IDC says in the next four years, no less than 90% of the world's largest public companies, um, they expect to going to mandate um, lower energy use, reusable materials, et cetera, for IT facilities as a prerequisite for doing business. That's, a, that's an enormous number. Um, 
and then you are on track to to offer all of your products as a service by 2022, uh, which is next year, another uh, a big, a big commitment. And the third figure that stayed with me, I guess, was um, you're saying two thirds of applications will remain on premises and, and cannot actually move to the cloud. And hence, there is a, a, a big business opportunity here for um, offering products as a service. Thank Definitely. you. Thank you very much. Ways from from me that I shall retain. Thank you very much for that. And we move on then. Um, and I'm afraid Brian is not going to not going to be able to stay with us for the whole session. Um, so if you have questions for HP, you're going to have to direct them to um, to Gareth, who's going to be joining us uh, a little bit later as we get going on the panel debate. Um, but first, we we turn now from HPE to the European Commission. And I'd like to welcome Florica Fink Hoyer, uh, Director General for Environment um, at the Commission. She's been with the Commission for, uh, for 30 years and with DG Environment just for the past year. So even in the Commission, it's possible to, to keep taking on a fresh challenge. Um, and in her capacity as Director General for Environment is, of course, responsible um, for implementing, well, big, big chunks of the Green Deal and notably the, everything around the, the circular economy. So I think what we're all uh, waiting with bated breath to hear is, is what can we expect, uh, and I know you're going to tell us all that, uh, what we can expect uh, on the Sustainable Product Initiative later this year, and then maybe a word if possible too on the uh, well mandatory standards for, for green public procurements. Um, you're mm -hmm. here on those. Okay. With, with pleasure, with pleasure. And uh, first of all, I'm pleased to be here, and I was very heartened by what I uh, when I listened to Brian, like they already embracing this circular economy um, business model. And um, it is indeed one which most of the industry should undertake, uh, uptake up, because otherwise we will not reach um, the uh, climate neutrality by 2050, which is one of the core elements of our uh, Green Deal. And let me perhaps also say that in that context, obviously the digital technologies have a very critical enabling role. Uh, if we want to achieve sustainability. I'm just quoting because this morning, uh, President von der Leyen was in the parliament and uh, delivered her State of the um, Union speech. And she was saying, I'm just quoting here, digital is the make or break it issue. And indeed, uh, you have heard about the twin green and digital, and that's why we work together. And indeed, let's say it, we need a very strong digital sector in Europe. Um, that puts us uh, uh, ahead in, in, in sustainability. And also in the past, I mean, for the last uh, 100 years, um, the electrical, but also electronic uh, industry has been really contributing enormously to our social, but also economic um, uh, growth and well well-being, and that uh, it should be. And uh, I think this morning, um, the President von der Leyen, I'm again looking at her speech, which is lying next to me, uh, introduced another one uh, element she said about, she spoke about tech sovereignty when she uh, announced a new European CHIPS Act. Now, this is not in my area, but it is uh, something just to tell how important um, the, the twin twinning of digital and green will be. Now, it will be taken up anyhow in, in every area, but let me also say um, all of this, be it um, digital solutions, uh, internet of the things, blockchain, they, of course, uh, rise a lot of energy and material resource consumption, even more than we have today. And um, this is quite important. But at the same time, you have also uh, not only a lot of um, electricity consumption through the uh, ICT industry. I think it's, I mean, I have it here, something like uh, 5 to 9 uh, percent. But it's also the one that creates the most uh, a fast growth based stream and that is also important although we just heard a lot can be recycled and all of this uh, but you also know that in the hardware we have a lot of rare earths and minerals which we obviously need to be recycling reusing if you want to go for also tech sovereignty um, and we need research that's for sure and investment now when we come to um, our sector i don't know you asked me now about um, the Sustainable Product Initiative, perhaps I have to explain perhaps uh, also a little bit what it is, because the idea is indeed uh, a set of regulatory um, norms 
which would make, um, I mean, a different way of how we will produce, but also consume. It is actually the the the, the regulatory breeding ground, if I may say so, for actually um, a, a forced industrial um, a revolution. So it's quite, quite important because we know that we have not enough uh, materials, so we need to um, have durability, repairability, upgradability, reusability, whatever. But for all of this, you need to know what's in the product, how it can be uh, uh, taken back and then uh, reused. And that is uh, what we will put not only for the electronics uh, and ICT products, but for a lot of other products into the SPI, as we call it. It's a sustainable product initiative. Now, this is a little bit the, the, the whole space that we need. Um, we, we will um, come forward with that by the end of the year. Um, it, it will be going hand in hand also with what we will call a digital product um, passport because in order to know whether you can reuse, re, re, recycle and all of this, you need to know what's in. And especially in, in electronics, it's often hazardous um, uh, substances. So we need to know how to break that down, which would be via a tagging, which uh, a product um, a passport, so that we know from the start until the end of the take, use, and then waste it, uh, you would know what, what is in. But Equally important, I think, is also to uh, understand that we want to um, incentivize, but even regulate, I have to really say that, that all these ideas of having a product being able to reuse, to repair, to um, recycle, starts at the design phase. And the design phase is basically the crucial moment. And that's what we will uh, um, regulate and then come with also sort of mandatory targets for certain types of, be it uh, recyclability, reusability, and so forth. Um, but this is, I think, where also IT producers have to come in. Because so far, um, you have the knowledge of the products and the services that are available, and um, you know what can be, uh, what is environmental friendly or not. And your environmental performance of the product must be known. But um, this has to be uh, coming together with proper communication and information tools. I already spoke about the product passport, but also vis-a-vis -vis the private and, the, and, the, and the, the consumer, but also the public buyer. And that brings me a little bit to, um, to the issue of green procurement, because so far, uh, most of uh, green procurement, especially in that area, has been uh, voluntary. You have a lot, a lot of um, codes of conduct, but also criteria, for instance, for um, criteria for data centers, green, what is green procurement criteria for data centers, server rooms, cloud services, uh, imaging equipment, smartphones, uh, tablets, whatever. Uh, all of this you have, but it's very voluntary. It works. It's partly already also um, embedded in the Eco Design um, Directive, which will be the basis for the uh, sustainable product framework. So partly it's already in as regards energy efficiency, but not for all the rest. And um, I think we will now uh, go in this future product-based legislation for minimum mandatory green public procurement criteria and targets. Uh, but also then in the sectoral uh, legislation that comes afterwards. And one of the sectors will be uh, ITC, uh, electronics, but also uh, other industries which have the high potential for circularity, but also are using a lot of um, resources, in, in particular um, energy. So we will have to come up with, um, as I said, this public uh, procurement criteria and targets which will be then mandatory in uh, this product-based legislation. Uh, but we also will have, um, I think, some requirements uh, in a phased-in manner, it's not coming from one day or another, uh, on compulsory reporting and monitoring, um, because otherwise we don't know uh, what is really um, happening in all of this. But coming back, I think um, 
the public sector has a certain leverage by green public procurement. But all, all in all, I, I said it this morning because there was an, another panel on, uh, on uh, circular economy, uh, and I said it's about 14%. It's not negligible, but it is having certain leverage, but the private sector, the consumer have more leverage. Still, it is something which we have to tap, because if we have uh, um, um, this leverage, we also have the responsibility to make sure that in our public procurement, be it from a municipality or the European Commission, but in any case, it has to be uh, a certain part of it should be the green public procurement. And I think it is important in particular for the, um, um, the electronics uh, sector. Why? Because I got only a data, which I have somewhere in front of me, which is almost 10 years ago, where it was said that public procurement contracts in uh, ICT is about 50 something plus billion. But that was in 2011, that was the data I received. 10 years ago, and now we have COVID, we had COVID hopefully, or we're coming out of COVID. You know how much we were taking up uh, very much all these uh, IT solutions, which also saved us obviously in, the, in, the, in connectivity, but you can estimate how much and how big now the public procurement market will be. And therefore, we have leverage and responsibility to make this public market to be uh, at least a green one. But it should not stop here. Uh, I didn't say so much about circularity in general, more about public procurement, green public procurement, and the SPI, so this product initiative. But it's all going hand in hand, but it's a part. You also have to work on other elements with the consumer, with the innovation, uh, with industry, with the uh, investment part. So it's all of us together. And I stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Florica, for giving us, uh, I think, a great overview of your, your thinking and a little bit what to expect toward, towards the end of the year. Um, and I think, yeah, very useful too that, that you mentioned the impact of, of COVID. And of course, the, the ICT sector was already um, a big part of, of everyone, every business's and every person's life. And that has only increased in the past year, one of the, the figures stru that struck me in your discourse was, um, I think you said it's the ICT as the fastest growing waste stream and therefore it's particularly important to, to think about what we do at end of life. And I'm looking forward to hearing more from HPE about how, how they indeed are, are, are tackling the, this issue and the kinds of technology, how they're managing to, um, to recycle uh, as much as they do. Uh, and therefore, we can expect in, in the Sustainable Product Initiative, so a particular focus on ICT and also uh, sectoral legislation and therefore targets, standards, et cetera, digital passports you talked about, also focus specifically on products and services in, in the sector. So I think looking forward to, yeah, to, find, to seeing it when, it's, when it goes live. Um, Florica is going to be with us until five o'clock. So we'll do send through questions um, for her if you have any. And in the meantime, I'd like to call up our uh, remaining speakers. So that's um, David Peck, um, Josephine Hintz, and Gareth Bevan. So we should have a little panel. And we'll give you each a chance to say something while people come up with questions for, for Florica. Um, so David Peck, maybe I'll introduce you in turn so it doesn't get too much. Uh, David Peck, Associate Professor for Climate Design and Sustainability, Circular Built Environment and Critical Materials, based at um, Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. He's also associated with various other universities uh, and works with various um, committees in the EU, also involved in Horizon 2020 and the EU KIC EIT on raw materials. Um, David, you're you're the uh, informed outsider, well, sort of outsider in this debate. Are you are you encouraged by by what you've heard both from from HP and and from the Commission? How do you see yes. this? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, uh, I would say this, wouldn't I? Because I'm heavily funded uh, by the European Commission, but thank good thank, thank goodness for the EU, and thank goodness for the leadership they show. Uh, my work wouldn't have been possible without it, so I thank them. Um, so I've declared my interest and my bias already. Um, but having said that, um, and, and it was already mentioned just now, we, we do face significant challenges. Um, and, and I like the analogy to the, to the Industrial Revolution. And 
I was just reflecting on it. <clears throat> you know, the pathway to our European Union started with a coal and steel union. And it started with a coal and steel union in the 50s because it was energy and the key material to rebuild a shattered Europe. Um, I think we're now going to rebuild a new Europe, a new world. And I think it's going to be around metals, key metals, which were mentioned already with examples like rare earths. Uh, and, and of course, it's renewable energies that are going to drive it forwards. Uh, so it's still the same problem, same challenge, different context and different era. Um, the challenges are as big, if not bigger, than our forebears faced in the 50s. Um, it's, it's a big, big, big challenge. But, and this is the key, and I picked this up uh, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, you know, what's the big challenge? One of the big challenges, and this this comes from the, the JRC, the uh, DG in charge of research for the commission, it's data. It's data and accuracy. We need to know a lot more to make the complex decisions we need to know. And therefore, when I hear the examples from HPE, yes, I am filled with optimism that we can solve those challenges. Great, thank you. That's good. Um, I'm hoping we're going to hear the same optimism from Josephine Hintz, since you're here um, representing at least a, a section of procurers. So hopefully you're as excited about what you're what you're hearing. Um, Josephine is here representing ICLE, so an international network of local governments working for sustainability. Um, she's in charge there um, of sustainable economy and procurement, has been on the team for the last um, three years um, and leads projects in this field both at European level but also um, further afield um, globally. Um, Previously ha has done research looking at more looking at the challenges uh, and opportunities associated with the the transition to a circular economy. Uh, Josephine, so local governments are, you know, how how far along are they? I suppose in their thinking, their interest in and their ability to to procure um, circularly or sustainably. Uh, and do you think, I mean, what we're expecting from the commission, the kinds of initiatives that are being taken on the, the corporate side by a company like HPE, are they going to make things easier and, and greener for them going forward? Thank you, Sonia, for, for that really good question. And thanks also for, for having me, inviting me to, to share a bit of what, what we're doing with local governments in, in Europe. And I can only kind of build on, on what Florica has been saying, that we are really looking at a twinning of green or circular um, together with digital. And the commitment is there. We see a lot of eagerness of, of local governments and, and public authorities overall, right, to transition to towards a circular economy. So at ECLE, we, we have um, a lot of commitments with the Circular Cities Declaration, as an example. And, and here, I think, with, with procurement, it's really the key tool to implement these policy targets on circularity, um, for instance. So for, for us, pro using procurement, it, it's really a way to institutionalize and operationalize these kind of strategic objectives when it comes to the wider transition. And so here, we, we always want to strike a balance, and this is really together with, with the public authorities. What, so representing them means to, to share the understanding of what procurement can do. And that is really to to implement on low carbon targets. That is about implementing circularity as well as social responsibility targets. And a lot of the public authorities they they want to be a role model and a leader in this to to act out of their public responsibility that they hold. However, we do see that a lot of I mean changing how one is procuring requires a whole organizational change. It's more than just changing the contract or changing the, the tender language, right? It does require almost as private kind of behavior change really to, to rethink what do we need as a public authority? What is about our concerns around security if it's just a service and we are not owning anything anymore, especially when it comes to ICT hardware? Um, or can we still drive the market in terms of social responsibility if it's not going to be kind of our products in the end? So there, there are a lot of questions and there 
yeah, there has to be an investment um, really in building that capacity for procurers, like at a practical level, to be able to implement. So the commitment is there towards circularity and ICT, I think, is a brilliant sector, as, as outlined before. There's there are so many challenges that can be tackled through circularity and responsible purchasing. However, it needs really an investment in building kind of knowledge and capacity and good practice. And I'm, I'm very glad to say that uh, ECLE and the European Commission are already working quite closely on that with criteria, et cetera, and, and guidance documents. Okay. I'll leave it at that, yeah. Okay, thank you. And the kind of, what's interesting, what, what you said that it's about more than just changing the tender language or sticking in a, sticking in a target and it, it needs a deeper think about how if you're suddenly not talking about products anymore, you're talking about services, what that implies for, um, for, I suppose, what you can take the lead on, what you can push for, what you can change, what standards you can set. Do you think that the, the Commission's thinking is, is I guess, far reaching enough in this regard and the things like capacity building and so on are, um, I guess, are getting enough attention and are part of this conversation that, that you know, the targets and et cetera, that there will be sufficient, I guess, an ecosystem context to be able to apply them and, and for procurers to be able to actually do something with them in practice? I think we are, we are definitely getting there. And I think here the, the key word is collaboration. So collaboration between policymakers and procurers, that's something that, that we're seeing more and more. Then it's, it's really about driving collaboration between buyers so to learn from each other and, and to exchange in working groups, for instance, on circular procurement, um, as well as to foster the dialogue, the collaboration with industry, with, for instance, companies like HP that are very kind of, let's say, conscious of their responsibility and, and proactive, changing um, their, their, their own practices. And this is then needs to be communicated to the public sector. And, and and we are yeah uh, facilitating a lot of market dialogue events and are guiding and, and, and training public procurers and how to deliver on that to sit down with industry in a very uh, let's say meaningful frame to discuss all these questions and to discuss all the issues and the targets of, of where to go and what is possible is the market ready are the procurers ready so it needs these spaces for collaboration and we are seeing an increase there but still we are talking about a very, let's say, front runner practice. This is not mainstream yet. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, let's turn to, to Gareth then. Gareth Bevan, so here also from, from HPE, uh, senior technologist um, for sustainable transformation. Um, again, more than 20 years experience in ESG in the electronics um, industry. And, and previously worked on uh, as an energy and sustainability engineer. And you have done a lot of work in, in particular with uh, customer collaboration on also the circular economy. So maybe you can, uh, one of the things you can pick up on is this, this notion of collaboration and how you work together with um, other parts of the, the value chain with, with customers um, on this journey uh, and some ideas of, of best practice in Europe, perhaps further afield what works well and what are you know what are the challenges that, that you that you're coming up against? Yeah, Sonia, thank you, thank you for the introduction and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my apologies to, of the darkness of my my camera in advance. Um, so to, to your initial point, Sonia, I mean certainly from you know customer engagement and the governmental engagement perspective with HPE, you know what's becoming what's coming across loud and clear is it's less about it's so much what we're doing and what our targets are within HPE. It's more from the customer's perspective on how we can help them realize their net zero goals, how we can help them contribute to the circular economy. So of course we can speak to our life cycle approach and speak about what we're doing in the design space in terms of you know, designing our products with the environment in mind and increasing and ever increasing the energy effectiveness of our products, so enabling our customers to do more with less. In fact, we've increased the energy effectiveness of our products uh, 3.2 fold in the last five years. You know, obviously from a materials perspective, we always try and design in the least impactful materials where, where feasible. Um, we design our products with quality in mind. We design them for longevity. We design them for repairability. And ultimately we would design them for recyclability where by material weight, upwards of 90% of our products are recyclable. 
you know, we can talk about our activities in the supply chain from, you know, responsible sourcing practices, um, from, from human rights to responsible mineral sourcing. And then we can talk about how we've enabled our supply chain partners to set science-based targets within their operations. We can talk about end of life. So, you know, I believe, as Brian mentioned, we have these fantastic technology renewal centers as part of our financial services organizations, which, you know, by the way, are supporting in excess of 15,000 customers across Europe today. I mean, 2020, they processed upwards of 3 million units, um, of which 87% were able to be remarketed, uh, with the remaining 13% going back through HPE's take back operations recycling facilities so we can talk about all of that but the elephant in the room when we look across our scope one scope two and scope three emissions are our downstream emissions and this this was acknowledged by the european commission during the formulation of the lot nine directive where you know, it was clear to all involved that from an environmental impact perspective over 70 percent probably closer to 80 percent of the impact was in the use phase so from a um as a service perspective as as brian alluded to earlier in transitioning our entire portfolio to as a service by 2022 we can chip away as much as we like at those areas for which we have absolute control as i mentioned earlier but it's how we address this this use phase but we know that there are huge inefficiencies still within data centers um you know, as, as Brian mentioned, 25% comatose um, compute in a, in a data center. Mm -hmm. You know, this is driving on a global scale $30 billion worth of wasted data center capital. And this is being driven by the over provisioning in data center IT resource. I think industry data suggests it's running at about 59% in compute and about 48% in storage. And again, in in our mind, this is being fueled by the traditional capex model of procuring IT. So the IT is procured for, in a forward-looking perspective based on business needs for the next two to five years. So it's it's human nature for those making the decisions to say this is what we're going to need, this is what we'll need in three years. Let's make sure what we buy today will meet our needs two or three years down the line. What as a yeah. service does is takes away that need for over provisioning because the customer is only going to receive what they actually need today to satisfy their data needs. So we can look at, we can address rather the comatose equipment issue, the over provisioning issue, and also the product life cycle issue. Um, and to go back to the comment that was made earlier with regard to security and will you be losing that level of control, the as a service can scale up and it can scale down it's not it's not about we will run all of these activities so everything is a service if there are security issues involved you you can accommodate for those activities and release and leave those in the hands of the of the public sector but take control of all other aspects of running that as a service to to drive up those utilization and optimization levels across the entire it infrastructure and with that, Sonia, I, I will stop there and turn it back to you. Thank you very much. It's a lot of, um, I think, really concrete examples of, of what you've managed to do and I guess implementing the idea of, um, of, of product as a service and the kind of savings that can deliver and why um, I thought particularly interesting that you can, so you can, you effectively change the, um, the procurement model so you, you're not having to, to buy, you're not having to buy an extra based on forecast demand. You're actually, as a customer, only needing to buy in and pay for um, what you need. And there's a corresponding reduction then in environmental footprint. So, so what, we, what it is, is, is a transition away from the CapEx model to an OpEx model. You will pay only for yes. what you use, the data yeah. you use. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you very much. We have a, a couple of questions that have come in. Um, one of them to you, Florica. So I'll, I'll start with that one, since uh, I know you've got to, to leave us at, at five. Um, the question comes from Francesca Poggiali, uh, Chief Public Policy Officer uh, at GS1. Will the product passports be stored in a huge central database, or are you thinking of a decentralized data system? And what will be the role for member states, if any? 
It's a very, very um, legitimate question. And when I was announcing already the uh, um, digital product passport, um, I, I was telling about something which we are in the process of setting up. Once, and it's DigiConnect who is working on that, and um, it is rather complex. But one, uh, one consequence we are seeing is indeed the huge amount of data space that we will be needing. And data space equals also then energy needs again. And that not necessarily is very environmental friendly, at least not in the moment. And therefore, we need to look at sustainable solutions with renewable energies. And I see um, David uh, nodding, and he will know much more about that than me. Uh, so we are aware of that challenge. I cannot tell you now uh, uh, how we will split that up in, in centralized or decentralized. It's, I mean, there's, you would always have also security issues, obviously. Mm. What is important, however, is that we ultimately would like to arrive that it's like your barcode today, that you have a product that you either buy or sometimes you only have the service for that, but where you have a, a, a really product, um, and I'm not talking, you know, your iPhone, right? Uh, that it is not so much for the consumer who might then in the future uh, um, get the iPhone as a service or the whatever you call it, but for those who own it really, the, the producers or those who want to recycle it, that from this product passport, they can scan it and they can see what is in, what type of also hazardous uh, substances might be in, so that those who might recycle it or break it or, or sort it might know. It's also a question of, of protection of workers in a way, so how to deal with it but also to know how much uh, has it perhaps, perhaps been, is it already second generation of use? Because that's what we ultimately want to aim at, eh? a really circular uh, uh, um, uh, uh, approach where you use certain materials and that can be metals uh, or certain minerals, not only once but twice or three times. That would be then visible on the product passport. But you would sort of read it like a barcode. But um, it it, I'm not hiding, it will require a lot of data space. And that's where we also now struggling with. So that's obvious. I have answered the other question on the chat, uh, but perhaps for the sake of others, you want to read it out and then I read out my answer. <laughs> yeah, true. I'm not sure everyone can see our chat. So it was a question also from Florica from Julia Bedini, a reporter at MLEX, asking what sectors apart from ICT will be covered by the Sustainable Products Initiative? Mm -hmm. Just to explain again, we would come up first with a sort of framework legislation to set out what are the principles, how do we want to go about it, and then roll it out in sectors which are having the potential, a high potential for circularity, but also are, again, it always comes back to what David said, energy, energy intensive in their, in their use. So that would be ICT, but very much steel, um, um, construction and building uh, uh, materials, chemicals, uh, but also textiles. I think these are issues where everybody understands immediately why we can recycle uh, or reuse or uh, upgrade or, or whatever you want to call it. Or like for ICT, I think one of the big challenge is to design a product from the start to be more durable, having a longer lifetime because everybody knows that your, your storage capacity is now built in in a way that it collapses after a while. So as you, you as a consumer buy a new phone, but it can also be done differently. Now people will say, yeah, but where's my business? Where's my profit? And there the idea of a service, a product as a service, I think can, can be quite attractive. And for the consumer, you don't, you don't pay for the rare earth, you don't pay for the energy, you don't pay, you only pay for what you use for the moment and then you give it back. So it's a very different business model. Yeah, yeah. Um, and have you, I suppose, yeah, if I, if I was to sum up the, what will be the, the biggest change for the ICT sector in the wake of, of the proposals coming up? Because there is a lot, already a lot underway and we already have, to some extent, standards. Um, we have lots of initiatives underway. How, how would you 
I guess, what would you say is, is going to be the biggest change for them? What, 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 should, what should, should companies be, yeah, be preparing for, be keeping an eye on? What will be the... Mm. We look at the entire uh, lifespan and also at the entire value chain, if you want. So um, I would rather say to factor in everything from mm -hmm. your whole environmental footprint. It is about measuring what is your environmental footprint. It can be with energy, it can be with water, it can be with minerals, it can be with, with, with uh, metal scrap, whatever you need. So you have to look at that and we will uh, coming forward sort of in the same uh, moment with what we call uh, environmental footprint methods, which have been developed very much also um, over time with industry, with the GSC, so Joint Research, uh, Research Center, and, and the, the practitioners, so, so it's not just like something coming from, from people who do not understand. Uh, and that would be helping, hopefully, in guiding, uh, on the one hand, the producers, but also allow consumers to say, is it really, is it really environmental friendly? Because we do have a lot of greenwashing. But you have to start somewhere. Yeah. And I think for rest, Garrett might be a better place to say where they start, because they have to start and look at the entire value chain, the high yeah. and the whole lifespan. Okay, yeah, no, I think that's a, the clear message is that the big change, because it's a lot of different initiatives, is really this this life cycle approach, which which hasn't been applied, I guess, across the board. Um, it has been applied in instances, and we haven't had the tools, perhaps, to, to do so either. As you say, things like environmental fr footprinting are all tools that are, are currently being being developed. Um, I'll give you a chance to, yeah, to, to respond, Gareth. Um, I'm aware, Florica, you're going to have to leave us in a moment. I haven't seen any other questions for you. So, so I would say, unless you have a question you'd want to put to one of our speakers, you're, you're welcome to do so to, to wrap up. If, if not, yes, you've got... No, I just no. want to say thank you for giving me also the possibility to explain a little bit of our thinking and mm -hmm. uh, a big compliment to the others. Uh, please, uh, we have to work together. And... Mm -hmm. uh, only together we can make this really fun, fundamental transformation. It's a real long-term but unavoidable one if you want to have still growth and something to consume in the future. So thank you for, for, for giving us the possibility to, to speak about it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining us and feel free to stay on the line and, until you need to go. Um, Gareth, do you want to, to respond to, to what Florica said and maybe give us an idea of whether you see this as a tsunami of change or, I mean, to what extent are you already implementing these things? Um, so, so there's no doubt that the change is coming. I mean, certainly speaking with our customers, they are looking for something which is very clear and simple to use as a differentiation. You know, mm -hmm. to, to, to Florica's point, you know, there's a lot of greenwashing. There's a lot of companies who will say, we, we do this, we do that. Um, but it, it's it, just to give you an example, I was speaking to a customer a couple of weeks ago and he said, um, it, you know, is there any kind of energy rating system that I can use similar to that that I can use when I'm buying, you know, a washing machine? Um, and, you know, as we know, there's something like over 100 um, eco labels just within the within the EU alone for various for various products. So, you know, we, we can align to some of those, but it, you know, it doesn't necessarily tell the, the customer anything. Um, equally, we can provide product carbon footprints for a sizable proportion of our product portfolio. And we're currently um, in discussions with a with a third party develop in addition to those product carbon footprints, which we could almost hopefully um, automate once that activity is complete, but also mm -hmm. provide life cycle assessments for those for those products as well. Um, so we are heading in this direction. The customer interest is certainly there, which is obviously driving this behavior. So I think, you know, to, to a degree, it's an, it's an inevitability. Mm -hmm. And what would you say is the biggest challenge you've come up against in your, um, your upcycling service? Um, as we heard at the start, one of them, the biggest challenges will be to do, will be to deal with an ever increasing stream of, of end of life, um, end of life material. Um, and you're you're already, I mean, engaging, have already engaged with this. What what's the biggest challenge, or what are the limitations to date, uh, and how you see those being overcome? So, so I don't see any limitations. It's certainly, every time that we have the conversations with customers and we talk about circular economy, 
the the asset upcycling service is always extremely well received because you know from their perspective as well it ticks their boxes in terms of contributing and driving more circular economy um you know the, the service is there as i said we're currently supporting in excess of 15,000 customers already across across europe um you know if the regulation changes and we need to be supporting significantly more units coming back into our trcs then scale may present itself as, a, as an issue I, we, we simply don't know as things stand today okay thank you um josephine uh, and david feel free to jump in too um you haven't had a chance to respond since we since we heard from gareth but some of these initiatives that he's laying out um so the the switch in business model from from capex to opex um the so the ability to to well to procure more according to your needs in theory i guess with a lower 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 total cost lower environmental footprint the idea of digital um of digital product passports so that you know better uh, what you're buying, um, the kinds of the scale of, of efficiency improvements. I mean that that he's laying out here. Uh, how does that sound to you? Maybe Josephine first, as a you know representative of potential customers, do you get excited by this? Um, do these things seem you know seem like a, a genuine and interesting and, and useful proposition? What would you pick out, and what you know continues to worry you? Right. I think from from a customer perspective. It is a very interesting time to kind of witness this kind of switch and, and innovation. And I think that there is definitely a keenness, there there is an interest for sure to to switch fully towards circular within ICT. However, there is that hesitance. I just wanted to to emphasize this whilst yeah, in the use phase there are there is that leverage to influence the 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 um the emissions, of course, but also at production phase, there is a huge leverage. And also when we look at different aspects, so social responsibility or when it comes to resource efficiency, it's it's other stages as well. So I think from a customer point, especially from public authorities, what they want is really the, the assurance that not only one of the, the tick boxes is being met, but actually the the standard that they would like to to see is being implemented as well so i worked with i think six public authorities in the nordics last year which was initiated by the mayor of malmo actually to to create a joint statement of demand of circular and fair smartphones and there we identified nine points of commitment by 2025 and not only was this done in collaboration of the different public authorities and, and it has political commitment, but it was also discussed and vetted by industry in a market dialogue event. And there you can really see that circular can't come at the cost of social. And it is it seems possible, and this is something that also by, by Gareth um, in, input, it sounds really promising. We just need to make sure everyone is kind of on the same page of what this exactly means, because social responsibility, for instance, is very complex and there are different standards and there are um, so many different issues. And the supply chain is, as you all know, very complex and dynamic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first point you made was that even though I think Gareth said that more than 80% of the environmental impact um, uh, or yeah, the greatest bulk of the impact is in the use phase from a local government perspective, that other 20% is also important. So even though quantitatively it's perhaps smaller, um, it, qualitatively it's, it still counts. The governments still care. Absolutely. I mean, we, we don't only want 80%, let's say, uh, remission, emission reduction. We, we need climate neutrality in, in general so mm -hmm. yeah we we need to be very ambitious yeah, yeah. david yes uh thank you yeah and thanks uh good points raised uh, just again it's a job of an academic sometimes to step back a little bit we we're coming from a world of fossil fuels we we we, we power stuff on fossil fuels we still do and we know we're going to rapidly transition to a low carbon world. So we're moving from fossil fuels to powering by using metals. And that's a 
that's not the way a lot of people are thinking at the moment. They don't quite see it that way, but that is what we're going to do, and we're going to do it in very fast time. And Gareth said a moment ago, the, the elephant in the room. Well, there's another elephant in the room. That's this metal demand that this transition is going to require in the short term. And it is staggering. It is enormous. And the canary in the coal mine, to use that awful analogy, of these materials constraint boundaries are the critical materials. And Florica mentioned them a moment ago, the examples being the rare earths and so on and so forth. Now, our studies that we're doing are showing that supply and demand are not going to match in the short term by quite a big factor. Not just a little miss that requires a little bit more recycling and we can figure it. It's going to miss by a mile and it's going to present us all with an enormous challenge. What do I mean? Gen developing the renewable energy technologies to supply the power we need. Developing the infrastructure to transmit, and developing the infrastructure to control that power. Move to electric mobility. Now we look at the super services and ideas that HPE are going to offer, plus, 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 in order to, to manage and control this super ideas and circular economy. You stack all that lot up together, and we end up with a big, big mismatch. Now, that's that's the bad news of the story. The, the opposite news, and this is kind of paradoxical, those of us looking at these critical materials are moving more and more and more. We need to understand the data. The commission are saying this as well. The data and granularity of data beyond what we've ever looked at before, down to element level in everything, including these things, which if you don't know what you're looking at, that's a chip, and that's what's causing all the problems in the industries at the moment. Okay, right to understand those things, and then sharing that data. But now I have a big question. Who owns stuff? In the linear economy, it's quite simple. You transfer ownership between people. In a circular economy, that game doesn't work anymore. So does it belong to citizens? Does it belong to companies? Or does it belong to governments? No, governments are not used to playing this role either. And by the way, it's the data that will determine who controls stuff. And those questions we haven't answered yet. I agree and I'm totally behind HP and many other companies. We need to get moving. We don't have time to sit and think about it too long. But I do ask the, the job of an academic is to ask those questions. Who does this stuff belong to and who controls the data? Yeah. And those questions are not being answered. It's a very interesting question. And I guess, Josephine, you, you kind of hinted at it earlier about who, if, you, if something is a service, who, who does it? belong to I don't know Gareth do you want to to step in by the way on uncritical raw materials I'm conscious that's we can probably devote an hour and a half just to that <laughs> in its entirety um but Gareth, yeah if you want to pick up on, on that point and more I guess I think also David's yeah extended question over you know are yeah who, who do things belong to I guess this type of thinking you'll probably say HP but um is this kind of thinking also present in the company and how is your thinking around everything as a service, also trying to, to tackle these questions. I guess customers ultimately also, also want to be reassured and, and want to know what's what. Yeah, yeah so as, as I tried to speak to earlier, when we talked about everything as a service for Josephine's point with regard to security. Mm. It's, not, it's not always everything as a service. There will be kind of hybrid versions mm. of what that service looks like, but let's take it in the kind of literal sense of everything as a service where the ownership for that product retain, is retained by HPE through our uh, GreenLake product offering. Um, that product will remain with HPE. That product would then go back through our TRC, our technology renewal centers with a view to giving it a second life or if it can't be given, given a second life in the way it was initially intended, then it will flow back through the, the circular economy through our recycling facilities but as it stands today when that asset leaves one of our technology renewal centers and moves then into the hands of one of our recycling partners that ceases to be our asset yeah okay that that's clear i think 
Um, Josephine, did you want to come back at all on this point? Um, I actually, I do want to connect the dots when it comes to how do we how do we collaborate to kind of bring together demand and what is on the market or where also market actors looking towards and kind of how to how to um, get on the same page um, and and here i think there there is a tool which is called pre-commercial procurement so it's part of procurement it's not tendering it's not buying anything but it is, it is a project it's a process of innovation that is driven through a challenge that the for instance the, the public sector or an authority a government is is facing and is then working in a very um let's say like it's a co-creation process in a way bringing together procurers and selected companies in a multi-step process looking at what are the actual challenges in more detail um, what are the potential solutions through ideation and then building prototypes and so we we awarded we we have an annual prize of of distinguishing like uh, the the leaders in, in procurement in Europe called the Procure Plus Awards and CERN which I'm sure everyone knows um, won in 2019 through one of these pre-commercial procurement projects which was actually a large scale kind of scientific project for big data storage and analysis tools where they worked with the market through this process and in the end they they piloted the helix nebula science cloud i'm not going to go into too much detail but for anyone interested the helix nebula science cloud is it's it's a fascinating project where they established this cloud-based system um, that is taking into account the energy effectiveness of the data centers behind it and it has been done in collaboration and exactly meeting the de demand of the scientific kind of institutions that are dealing with with big data kind of projects so and i think that this pre-commercial procurement is really at a start mm -hmm. it's it, it's again not common practice because it takes a lot of capacity but i just wanted to say that there are opportunities to really come together. We we just need to disseminate these tools further and to to be to to use them purposefully and effectively. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Either of you want to come back? If not, I've got another question. Uh, just just a quick one. Um, it was mentioned by Florica. She said, uh, you know, public sector procurement is around fourteen percent. Obviously, it varies from country to country. It can be higher um and then you know there was a well that's not so much and i'm thinking well a lot of companies i'm talking to need something to get a kickstart they need some business to get moving on so i would turn around and go yeah it might only be 14 percent, but it could be the crucial 14 percent which gets the ball rolling now i think possibly and florica can't answer this because she's not here but governments and, mem and the EU are turning around and saying, yeah, but you don't understand how public sector procurement works. There's a lot of laws, regulations and ba barriers that stop us saying you can only bid if you have a circular proposition because it shuts other companies out. And the EU, yeah. big, so that all needs to be changed and it needs to be changed quickly, but it's a pandora's box of of legal wrangling between member states and interested parties which will slow that down but that's got to happen in my opinion sorry yeah no it's a very valid point gareth did you want to respond on that as well and josephine's idea of pre-commercial procurement as a yeah a, an avenue to to look into uh, no but i absolutely agree with uh with, with david's comment it's um it it might say it's only fourteen percent, but fourteen percent of of um of a lot of money is is a lot of money, um, and there is a huge opportunity there. Yeah, yeah, we heard Florica's yeah fifty fifty billion plus in public procurement contracts for ICT back in well ten years ago, two thousand eleven. Um, I we're going to start wrapping up i guess relatively shortly if there are other questions from anyone joining us today now is the moment to to send them in um so please do one question i still had was um 
was st something something that that we heard um, that we heard at the very beginning from from Brian that HP is basically you know you've set this target to offer every um, to offer make make all of your solutions available as a service by by 2022 and you're on track to do this. Mm -hmm. So coming back to as a service, are there are there trade offs that we also I mean that you're coming up against here and that we also need to to navigate. Um, thinking there are when you're going down the route of circular economy i imagine there are trade offs i mean some materials are more durable but perhaps less recyclable so it's i mean things like that but specifically with the the as a service model are there there are trade offs that we're going to have to accept uh negotiate you know potentially compensate for and i guess on the positive side are there there are innovations that that you know your discovering along the way that are making the the as a service concept more palatable and, and mitigating the effects of, of any trade-offs um. so i i don't think there are any trade-offs there may be the one trade-off in terms of life cycle management um so you know as i mentioned the through the as a service model we we can address the the life cycle management piece um mm -hmm. you know just just to throw some figures out to you uh, i think it was in 20 19 the um, uptime institute did an assessment of uh, of data centers and found that um, for products over five years of age made up something like 40 percent of the installed base yet we're only doing about seven percent of the workloads yet drawing 66 percent of the power so I, I think you know life cycle management is an important part but you know although we can offer this asset upcycling there does become this or there does come this moment in time where even if there is a demand for that particular asset um, through another customer it is actually more environmentally beneficial to put that asset through the recycling stream because the energy consumption for those that old equipment is fast far more than what you would be consuming if you were to to refresh your it so there is that you're not my point being you're not always going to be able to upcycle these assets because the environmental yeah. downside from electricity far outweighs the benefit yeah okay um josephine david any any thoughts on this and i guess yeah potential pitfalls we should be aware of of trade-offs and ways to to mitigate those um as we're going down this road towards circularity and, and as a service in particular within the ICT sector. Josephine? <laughs> uh, one thing I would say is, um, as with all things that are constrained and energy is constrained and materials are constrained and are going to be increasingly constrained, either through our own decisions or because of physical issues. When things are constrained, we have to make decisions, choices. We do this or we do that, or we do this or we do that. It can't be left to the private sector alone to do that because that's not their job. And it can't be left only to citizens to make consumer choices to do this. Governments, be they municipal, regional or central governments, are going to need to change their role and start making choices on what we do. And they're gonna to have to do it a lot more and a lot quicker. Um, I must admit, in my dealings with governments, there is a great reluctance to have to take on that role because they haven't had to do it since the Second World War in Europe. Hmm. Governments did, in the past, make decisions on who got what when. But that's coming, that's my opinion. Okay, thank you, Josephine. So speaking, let's say, on behalf of local governments or pu public authorities on, on the topic of procurement, I think that perhaps turning to towards them as well, um, addressing them specifically is, is interesting in, in this context, because I mentioned a few times that what we're talking about here is not yet mainstream practice kind of procuring ICT in a circular way or for, for in a service model. However, things are starting to move and there are a few front runners 
that that are putting this on on the map and that are aware that this is more than changing just the the tender language. Um, it needs institutional reform. And what you mentioned, David, that takes time. And we, we've seen that um, in, in the past that things are more complex when, when it comes to organizational change. However, given the urge, urgency right, of, of this topic and, and given also that some companies like HP are very much um, proactively driving this from, let's say, the supplier side, is enabling this transition. So governments and public purchases should not be shy of, of joining that and, and being proactive themselves and investing into that change that we need. Okay, thank you. I haven't seen any further questions to, to any of you individually come in. So we'll wrap up then with a, a question to each of you. Looking ahead to, to COP26 uh, in November, in Glasgow, hopefully still happening. I keep getting emails with various groups calling for it to be postponed, but it's still on for now. Um, so obviously every everyone, every country, every company, I think has a, a net zero strategy these days. Um, what, does, what do you, so each of you, what do you think should be the priority for the, the tech sector, so the ICT sector to, um, to do its part to ensure the, the, I guess, the most efficient acceleration to net zero emissions. Can I go first? You can. I, I, I just, um, the words just first. came to me. Yeah. I think that coming back to, to also the, the wider picture, what we're seeing, we, we have the Green Deal, we, we have the digitalization agenda in the EU, um, more and more services are being digitalized. Um, government operations are being digitalized. So there is a huge increase of ICT solutions, whether that is software or hardware. And we just can't afford to not twin that with the green transition and making sure that this increase doesn't come at a cost of more environmental damage. So we need to make sure that low carbon solutions are at the baseline of designing this increase in the digitalization. So and I think that we need to just take that learning from the past of where we are right now and, and just make sure that we design our future in a better way and the tech sector is well equipped and, and much knowledgeable on, on how to do that by now, I think. Shall, shall I go? I'm short and I'll leave some time for Gareth. I've already said it, but I think for COP26, I turn around and go companies, governments, uh, universities and research and technology organizations need to come together to figure out the pathways to ensure we have the materials to build and operate the low carbon circular economy we so desperately need. And we need to do that in partnership together. Um, and I would say finally, it's not about asking with technology, what can we do? It's asking, what should we do? What choices do we have to make? Okay, thank you. You're not an engineer, or are you? Engineering, you are usually about what can we do. I know they are. That's um, I, I, I am one, and I'm surrounded by them. Okay. <laughs> You're the exception to the rule, then, <laughs> Gareth. So, obviously, continued innovation is one within the technology sector, you know, obviously continuing to increase the energy effectiveness of our products, enabling our customers to do more with less, continuing to take a life cycle approach across all scope one, scope two, scope three emissions, and obviously doing all we can to continue to decarbonize our products. You know, with the way the, the the data growth is at the moment, and I believe Varika may have touched on it earlier. And really to David's point as well, it's, it is a genuine threat with the fourth industrial revolution because the way IT is procured and utilized today is absolutely not sustainable. We need to look across the entire value chain at how we use and consume and generate data 
and simply reduce it. And if that is through you know, artificial intelligence to, to look at the data that we're generating, to, to generate you know, insights and drive those insights into actions and ultimately reduce the actual data to what we, we genuinely need in a real quick time, then that in my mind is where we need to head. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll retain that sentence right towards the end. So the way IT is procured and utilized today is, is absolutely not sustainable. Um, and I think we've heard today lots of different ways in which that can be made um, more sustainable. And then finally, fully fully sustainable is, is obviously the, the goal. Um, a big thank you to all of you um, and Florica and Brian, who are no longer with us now, for your, your contributions. I thought it was a really interesting, interesting discussion. Uh, I think it was it was very concrete. And then some of the, the examples that, that we heard from uh, from you in particular, Gareth, on just just what's possible and the, the kinds of initiatives that HP is is undertaking, the the ambitions. So for you know all solutions to be offered as a service by by next year, um, the I think the 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 the, uh, the fact that a, a quarter of Brian said a quarter twenty five percent of compute resources are powered on but not actually doing anything, and then the ways that you can basically eliminate that that inefficiency. Um, they're very very inspiring. Um, I think the the three I guess some of the three of the takeaways for me will be indeed the the enormous potential of this switch to an opex based approach and then the savings that are possible there both in terms of cost for for the customer and then in terms of carbon and more broadly uh, environmental footprint um i guess that depends indeed on uh, a certain amount of of it sustainable it being located on premises um, and that ratio of how much is on site versus how much is in the cloud. I guess we don't know that that for sure, um, but certainly it seems sensible to prepare for a large chunk of it to be on site rather than just kind of assuming it won't be. Um, and to make sure that it's, uh, as you say, you have a fully uh, equivalently, uh, well, it's a fully sustainable solution for that, uh, which is as good as moving things to the cloud. Um, and I thought Josephine's, and I guess David too, the, the point that although most of the, impact comes from the use phase that the the, the kind of the the upstream part is going to be important as, e uh, as well for for procurers although it's a smaller part i guess that too there needs to be a an amount of of, of social and environmental responsibility um and uh, i think again some of the the questions that the bigger questions you raised david and, and josephine too and i come back to what you said about it's more than just changing the tender language and i think florica emphasize that too it's uh a new gareth everyone really that it's a much, we're talking about much more than just a simple change change in terms and conditions it's a completely different way of, of looking at things and you get into you know very fundamental questions over who's who owns what who's responsible for what um how do you incentivize certain things um and yeah sort of a almost a, a cultural um and educational change that that's required uh, and, and collaboration is clearly the, the key word for, for taking that forward. Um, yeah, Florica said for her that the big impact is this um, this move to to life cycle thinking, which I think we are starting to see in, in companies like like HPE. But as you as you say yourself, there's still a lot more that can be done there. Um, the good news is these, these tools are being made available both on the on the policy side and then bottom up in house through through companies um, like like yourself, um, Gareth. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a pleasure to to moderate, and um, I hope we we stay in touch. Thank you, everyone, for for joining us this afternoon, and thank you for those of you who sent in your questions. Obviously, if you want to follow up with speakers individually, feel free to do so. Um, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you very much.